Thank you to all the new faces here and some of the familiar faces I haven't seen in a while. And thank you for everybody joining us to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're going to begin. I'm, I'm just going to read something, and then we're going to jump into uh, uh, some passages out of 1 Corinthians 15. Okay? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked that question, do we believe this? But Paul says something very interesting over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he poses a very, well, he poses something very important. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. It starts here. It says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how come some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, which is considered one of the greatest sins in Judaism, to misrepresent God. Because we testified about God that he raised Christ. Whom, he did, not, whom he, he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Man, that cannot ring any more true. But see, there, for a lot of people, they question, did Jesus actually rise from the dead? I mean, that's rather supernatural, is it not? I mean, generally when people die, they don't get back up out of the grave. That's reasonable to believe that, right? Because we don't see evidence of people getting back up out of graves. But there, there comes, there comes a, a situation here, though. If dead people don't get back up, then we of all people should be most pitied because the entire faith of Christianity is centered around this one guy getting back up from the dead. Our faith is completely, utterly debunked and futile if indeed the resurrection is not true. Everything hinges upon that one event. In fact, the entire narrative of Scripture is pointing to that one event. Jesus says multiple places, all the passages of the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, it points to me. So if everything is being fulfilled and satisfied in Jesus, and then the guy ends up dead, but he doesn't get back up, then everything falls and ends and stops with him. We must wait another. Because the Bible prophesies in the Old Testament, that the Messiah would come, that he would die, that he would spend three days in the grave, but then on the third day he would rise again. Even more importantly, Jesus, he, he, he put his entire ministry based upon that one fact that I am going to go and die, and no sign shall be given to the Jewish nation, even though as we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is giving many signs. They kept asking for more. They kept asking for more. They kept asking for more. The writer of uh, uh, John in his Gospel says, there's not enough books in the world to fill, to record all of the things that Jesus has done. Jesus was constantly doing signs, but yet they asked for more. And he said, you know what? No other sign will be given this wicked generation except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, boy, that one's tough to believe, is it not? So the Son of Man will spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus seems to believe that Jonah's experience was true, that Jonah really went through that, that Jonah actually spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. See, God is a God of miracles. He does supernatural things. But if the resurrection isn't true, if today that we celebrate the resurrection, and for those that were here last week and here for the Passover meal, as we talked about, we actually, this week, lines up exactly to the week that, of Jesus' Passion Week. Last Sunday was the literal day that Jesus rode in on a donkey into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives God's glory returning back to his people. The same, 
It returned the direction that it left, as we looked at from the scriptures in Ezekiel. Right? God's glory left Israel. God's glory returned, coming from the east, just the same direction that it left. He rides in on the donkey, and he begins being inspected for four days, just like is what's required of the Passover lamb out of Exodus 12. You take a lamb on the 10th day of the Hebrew first month, you inspect him for four days, then on the 14th day you slaughter the lamb, and that is the Passover lamb. Jesus comes in, and as we went through these, uh, these past couple messages, Jesus comes in on the, on the donkey, he comes in on the 10th of Nisan, just as a Passover lamb is supposed to be selected, and then he is inspected. He's inspected by, by Jews. He's brought before Caiaphas, was he not? They find no fault in him. They can't even get testimony to agree against him. So what do they do? The Bible says they bring in two worthless fellows, two worthless people, to make a false accusation so that there could be a count of two to, hold, to, to be able to uh, send Jesus to judgment. But they found really no fault in him. Then they send him before Herod. They send him before Pilate, all of which say, we find no fault in this man. God's Passover lamb was inspected for four days, and they found no spot or blemish in him. Yet they yelled out, even more so, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. We played on the irony within this. Barabbas is, the, is in, in Hebrew, his name is Barabbas, son of the father. So catch the irony of what's going on here. The real son of the father, they're saying, send to the crucifix, kill him. The false son of the father, Barabbas, Barabbas, he's a murderer, he's a thief, he's a cheat, and they're saying, release him, give us him. But crucify the true son of the father. Now, Jesus goes to the grave, but I want to come to, again, back to this point. What's the reason that we celebrate the resurrection? What's the reason we reflect upon it? What's the reason that Jesus even had to go there? Well, it goes all the way back to a garden. And in the Garden of Eden, there's a problem that took place. When God made a man and woman in his image, he put them in a garden, and this garden was beautiful. And it was in a state of perfection. There was no evil. There was no sin. There was no wrong there. But the enemy, remember where the enemy first sinned, where Satan first sinned. Where was it, church? He sinned in heaven, right? In the throne room of God. He comes to the garden and he tempts Eve. Now, he, in tempting Eve, he's also finding a back door to get to Adam. Okay? He tempts Eve. Eve then sees the, uh, of the fruit on the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil that it's to be desired, the Bible says. And that it's used to make one wise. In fact, as, as the enemy said, it will make you like God. And this is why God doesn't want you to eat it. Because you'll be like him. You want to know the irony within this? they already were more like God than Satan ever was. Satan was never made in the image of God. None of the angels were, but humanity was. They already were made in the image of God, yet he tempted them with something they already possessed. She eats of the fruit. Church, what happens when she ate the fruit? Nothing happened. But then she gives some to her husband, who was with her. That lump was there the whole time. And he doesn't say, shut your mouth, serpent. We will not disobey the word of the Lord. The enemy knew this, that he would be able to deceive Adam as well, listening to the conversation he was having with Eve. And Adam takes of the fruit, and he eats. And what happens? Immediately, their eyes were open, and they found themselves naked. They realized the shame and guilt that they possess now. When Adam hears the voice of the Lord in, in the garden, calling out, where are you? By the way, in the Hebrew, it's singular there. It's not plural. God wasn't asking for both of them. He was asking singular for Adam. Not because he didn't care about Eve, but there's something in particular the Bible is telling us is going on here. Where are you? And Adam goes and hides himself. They make for themselves clothing made out of fig leaves. Finally, Adam responds to God and says, I was afraid to come to you. Why were you afraid? Well, we're naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree that you weren't supposed to eat from? Well, Lord, it's the woman you gave me. She gave it to me. Okay, Eve, is, is that what happened? Well, the, the, it, it, it was the serpent. The serpent deceived me. He, it's, it's really his fault. They started passing 
the blame, did they not? Not once do you see them say, God, I messed up. I have sinned against you. I've transgressed your command. They don't do that, do they? So they begin casting the blame to one another. Not only that, but notice the indictment Adam does against God. The woman you gave me, God. Really, God, it's your fault. If you didn't give this woman to me, this wouldn't have ever happened. I'll tell you that much, right? It's really her fault. He's blaming God for his own action. How often do we do that? How often do we do the exact same thing? We blame somebody else for our own actions. Even worse, we'll blame God. Well, God, if you did this, or God, if you did that, yada, yada, yada. And we pass the blame. We push it off. But in that moment, beloved, when Adam ate that fruit, the covenantal relationship that God had with man was severed. It was broken, and there was a great need. So and then when God begins telling everyone the consequences. He first speaks to the serpent. He says to the serpent, now you listen here. Because of what you've done, to your belly you will go, and on your belly you shall remain. And the seed of the woman is going to crush your head, and your seed is going to bruise his heel. Now, a lot of our Bible translations will change the word to offspring, but in particular, in Hebrew, the word is seed. Now, what's interesting about this is what God is saying. He said, look, there is a moment that now humanity is in desperate need of. It's in need of being reconciled, redeemed by me. Humanity did not apologize. They didn't ask for forgiveness. They didn't say, hey, what can we do? Even if they had, there must be blood that is shed on their behalf because something innocent has to die in place of the guilty. And we see this incredible amount of grace take place in the garden. We see God go and slaughter an animal and clothe Adam and Eve with the skins of that animal. God interceded on their behalf, though they asked not for his help, that he interceded on their behalf because he loved them. And he went and shed an animal so the innocent blood of that animal would cover their sin, but it was just a covering. There was not full forgiveness. The, the sin still remained. The wrath of God still needed to be satisfied. And now we see this moment in history where everything that God created was now severed and broken. Importantly, the covenantal relationship between God and humanity was broken. And there was nothing man could do to reconcile, to get this thing redeemed and get it right. So now we've got a problem because God says through the seed of the woman, this redemption is going to come. This is really interesting that this, the seed doesn't come from the woman. The seed generally comes from the man. He says the seed of the woman, it means this offspring is going to take place. Something, something is going to come out of the woman that is going to be able to reconcile. God is going to do something through the, the woman to reconcile all of humanity back to himself. But we've got to figure out who this person is going to be. So now the Bible kicks off. We see after the fall, after these first four chapters uh, in the offspring of Adam, we see that humanity starts to decline. We see this man named Noah comes onto the scene, right? And God says, look, the wickedness in man's heart is so great, it's evil in their minds and in their hearts continually. Jesus said that before his return that he comes, so it's going to be like that in our days. It will be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot before the coming of the Son of Man. You wonder why the world is falling apart? It's going to return back to what we see. The, the, Bible all, the Bible does this incredible job of showing like these two bookends. What started in the bookend in the beginning, we're going to eventually get back here and, and write. Right? What started in the garden where it severed and fell, we're going to end up back in the garden in Revelation, and it's going to be made perfect and right. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life that was now Adam and Eve were rejected from being able to eat. You know why God kept them from eating from the tree of life? Because if they ate from the tree of life, they would have immortality and they would forever live separated from God. And God wouldn't have that. He loved them too much for them to forever be separated from them. But guess what shows up back in Revelation? That all those that are found in Christ Jesus get to eat from? The tree of life. The book ends. 
So something is lost, and God has a whole plan in the middle to reconcile and bring about back what his original plan was. But we've got to navigate to find out how, how and who is going to accomplish this task for us. So we come to Noah. It's evil in Noah's days. God is going to flood the planet. He regrets making mankind because they continue to choose evil. They continue to be say, separated uh, from God, and they reject what he is attempting to do in them and for them. So God floods the earth, and it starts over with Noah and his family. All of us in this room are descendants of Noah. It's your brother and sister right next to you. All descended to Noah. Noah is a direct descendant of Adam. Thus, we are all descendants of Adam and Eve. So now, as, as the world begins to repopulate, the family, uh, human population is starting to expand exponentially, very, very quickly. God then calls a man out of the land of the Chaldeans, out of the land of Ur. What's his name? Abraham. Abram, come on, come on out of this land. He calls Abram out of the land, and now, Abram, out of you, out of your loins, I'm going to bring this Messiah, this figure that is going to be able to reconcile the world to myself. Abram, Abram says, you know what I need to do? Sarah and his wife says, you know what we need to do? <laughs> We're pretty old. We're going to need to help God in this matter. So here, why don't we do something on our behalf? Abram, why, why don't you take, this is Sarah, speak, his wife speaking, why don't you take one of my servants and have a baby with her, and then that can be your offspring, okay? That wasn't the offspring, was it? Ishmael was not the baby that was promised. It was Isaac that God had promised. So God supernaturally has Isaac born. But then what is Abraham supposed to do with Isaac? Sacrifice Isaac. God was never intending for Abraham to actually follow through and sacrifice Isaac. We get this in multiple places in, in Scripture. But Abram walks with Isaac and, and, and the servants all the way to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is significant. God, God sends Abram, Abraham and Isaac and his servants out on a walk and journey. He says, go until I show you where you are to sacrifice your son. They arrive at Mount Moriah. Here, Abraham is where it's supposed to be. He tells the servants, stop and wait here. He takes Isaac. He says, Isaac, take, put the wood on your back and carry it up the mountain, and, and I'm going to meet you on top. They, they come on top of the mountain. Uh, as Abraham tells the servants, wait here until I and the lad return to you. Abraham always knew God was either going to be able to resurrect Isaac from the dead or he was going to halt his hand before he actually went through it because God would not break his promise to Abraham. If a Abraham actually killed Isaac, what would happen? The promise of God is void. God is a liar. And God is not going to lie, right? So he takes Isaac up to the mountain. They build the altar with the rocks. They put the wood on top. Isaac says, hey, Pop, listen, I see, I see the altar. I see the wood. But where's the sacrifice? Abraham says what? God will provide his sacrifice. He puts Isaac on top of the wood. He, he, he puts up his blade. God says, stay your blade, Abram, grab the ram in the thicket. You know what's interesting about Mount Moriah and that whole picture with Abraham and Isaac? That's the same mountain that Jesus is going to be crucified on as he carries his cross to it. Where God would not ask Abraham to sacrifice his own son, God did not spare his own son carrying his cross to that mountain to sacrifice himself. Now we move forward. We've got Isaac. Isaac. Isaac has a couple boys, Jacob and Esau. Which one is it going to be? Which one is the line going to take? The Bible says it goes with Jacob. Jacob then has 12 sons. Now we've got a problem. Where is it going to go now? God narrows it down to the tribe of Judah. We continue carrying this out. God is constantly funneling this down, showing us through all these prophecies. That's what all this text in the middle here is for. It's narrowing it down so that we can identify exactly who this messianic figure needs to be that was prophesied all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 when it was severed, when the relationship was broken. We come all the way down to David. David says, God, I want to build you a house. God responds to David and says, David, you can't build me a house, son. There's too much innocent blood on your hands. But I'll tell you what I'll do for you. I'll build you a house. Out of your loins is going to come the Messiah. One that's been long awaited, the one that's been promised, the one that we've been waiting for from you, it's going to come. 
And David, overwhelmed with this, can't believe that God would be willing to do something like that through him. David writes a very interesting psalm. One of the psalms that he writes is Psalm 22. He wrote many, but interesting in respect to Psalm 22. The beginning of Psalm 22 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did those words sound familiar? So those of you that know your Bible, those exact words Jesus said on the cross. Jesus was pointing back all those around the cross that were there listening. He's like, go back and read your Bible, sons. It talks about me. It says what I was here to do. And if you read through Psalm 22, you will see multiple things in there that Jesus is directly fulfilling right out of Psalm 22. I behold, I can see all of my bones. We're going to get to that, how he went through scourging. The the dogs, they, 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 they wag their tongues around me. That's indicative of, come down off that cross if you really are the Son of God. Let's see if you can really do it. They're they're mocking him. They're mocking him. It talks about all this right here. They divide my garments, just like what happened. It's all written right there in Psalm 22. David writes this when God blesses David and says, the Messiah will come through your loins. I mean, this is powerful stuff. God is very active and very aware in human history, in our lives, what he is doing. You know what that tells us? What does that tell you and me? It tells us that God is faithful. It tells us that God is capable of not only paying attention to what's going on, but he's capable of interceding in our lives and what's happening. He actually cares about what's going on in your life. In fact, Peter even writes, cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. You want to you want to show God, Christian? This is for the Christian. This isn't for the unbeliever. Christian, you want to show how show God how, how you love him? It's quite easy. You cast all your junk upon him. That seems pretty, pretty silly, does it not? That's not how I work. I get pretty worn out when people keep giving me their burdens. <laughs> but God says, cast all of these things upon me because why? I care for you. I care for you. You want to show God you care for him? You give him your junk. And we see this example take place in Jesus with the woman at the well, right? The woman at the well has got all this baggage and all this junk. And Jesus is like, hey, look, I've got some living water to free you and deliver you from all of this stuff. Will you drink from the, from the cup that I would give you? Where would I get this living water? It comes from me. I am the well. I am the spring. I am the source of that living water. And we see in John chapter 4, the woman takes of what Jesus has. The Bible says that Jesus was exhausted when he went to that well, but... When the woman took of what Jesus had to offer her, his disciples come back with food and they see him just totally full of energy, filled with life. And they start asking him, did somebody bring him food? Did someone get him something? Where in the world did he get? Where did he get this energy? And he says to his disciples, I eat a food you know nothing of. When we take of the abundant life that Jesus offers to us, when we take that, it invigorates him. When we give him our junk, all of our sins, all of our, all of our, ugh, you know, our chains, our bondage, our depression, our anxiety, all of it. When we give it all to him, it invigorates him because of what it is, what David realized, King David realized after he sinned greatly with Bathsheba and murdered Bathsheba's husband. He said, if it was the blood of bull and goats that you wanted, I would sacrifice thousands. But it is a, the only sacrifice that you receive, God, is a broken and contrite heart. Uh, What does that mean? A heart that recognizes its needs for what God can give them. It's a place of humility. There's nothing I have to bring you, Lord, except my junk. Good, I'll take it. I'll give it. And in return, I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to give you my righteousness. I'm going to give you my goodness. What an incredible exchange. So now we've got David. David in this line. Okay, now it's narrowed down to one. All right, David, where is this going to come? And we see God continually tracking this all the way through these kings. And we finally get down to the New Testament. And we get the genealogy of of, uh, of Joseph and of Mary. We get the genealogy in Matthew and in Luke, one of each of them, to show the, the lineage all the way back to David and all the way back to Adam. What's the significance of that? Why in the world? Most of the time, you know, when we read our Bibles, we just blow past those genealogies. Like, oh, God, that's boring. Okay, let's get on to the next thing. Who, who does that? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. In the genealogies, there is great depth. And especially in Jesus's, it's very fascinating. There's three women that show up in Jesus's line, in his lineage. 
And, and it's pretty interesting, these women that show up, because the, the thing that each of them have, like, in common, is they're not Jewish. Some of them have sexual immorality in their life. You know what all three of them have in common? As well as all the men, they're sinners. They're just like you and me. And Jesus comes through their lines. But it's fascinating what takes place as we get to this point. Before Jesus is born, there's this what's called an intertestamental period, a period of a couple, hun- a period of a couple hundred years between the book of Malachi and the, and, and the book of Matthew. We just flip a page. <laughs> but in history, there's a, there's a pretty big lull there. And in that lull, this is a time when it appears God is totally silent on, on his people. Because prior to this, the reason why God gets silent is Israel refused to worship God the way that God says he was to be worshipped. They refused to give Sabbath rest to the land. So God said, you know what? I'm going to exact an account on you. Because you refuse to repent and you want to stay in your sin, I'm going to take some time back from you. Now to bondage you will go. And Babylon comes in and they defeat them. And they take them back to captivity in Babylon. The irony here again beloved, is that Abraham was called out of the land of the Chaldeans. You know what that land is? It's Babylon. Because of the refusal to repent that they wanted to stay in their sins, I will do it my own way. Surely God would never let destruction or disaster come to me. We are God's chosen people. God has placed his temple here in our land. God would never, never allow us to be destroyed. But when we refuse to repent, As the Israelites did, God did allow that destruction to come, and they were taken to captivity for 70 years. Now, there's a whole lot of awesome details within here, and I won't won't bog us down with all this, because now we get to Jesus. Come back here to the New Testament period. The glory of God left right before God allowed Babylon to come in and destroy them. And the Bible says in Ezekiel, Ezekiel said he watched the glory of God leave out of the holies of holies into the holiest place, out of the tabernacle or the temple, out of the temple into the courtyard, out of the courtyard into the city, out of the city, and he kept going east, farther and farther east. His glory departed his people. And now we come to the time of Jesus when Jesus is born. When Jesus is born, this is such a a miraculous event, such a special event that who showed up to announce this event? The angel, right? Right? And who did he announce it to? A bunch of lowly shepherds. These aren't the elite of the the society. These are the lowest rung. This is the lowest rung people. He announces it to shepherds because why? God always comes to the lowly. He rejects the proud and he comes to the lowly. Always, always, always. And he comes and he announces. And you know what the angel announces? Peace and goodwill unto who? All men. Now look. We just look at this and go, yay, what a fun time to celebrate at Christmas. Do you understand something else is happening here? Supernaturally, what's taking place here, an angel shows up to make this announcement, right? And he says, peace and goodwill unto all men. He's actually acknowledging that a covenant is about to be redeemed. A relationship is about to be redeemed in this little babe here. In this babe, there is something much bigger. That peace and goodwill, it's not going to come just because God is going to say, hey, I'll just turn, my bl- I'll turn a blind eye to that sin. Don't worry about that. You can just continue on as well. Pretend it didn't happen. No, peace and goodwill be extended unto men because of what this baby is going to do. And this baby grows up. And this baby, at, at, at around 30 years of age, he is baptized. And as soon as he is baptized, the father speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son. And what? In whom I am well pleased. Jesus then immediately, led by the Holy Spirit, goes into the wilderness to be tempted. He is tempted. Three temptations, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, the things that every single one of us struggle with. Jesus is tempted with those things, and he conquers the enemy by the word of God. Jesus then enacts about three, three and a half years of ministry. And during that time, during that three, three and a half years, he performed so many miracles, so many signs, so many acts and demonstrations of God's love towards his people. And we know that it was the Father's love towards his people because why? The writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father. You want to know who who God is? You want to know how God really is? You look at Jesus. You want to know what we should look like? You look at Jesus. 
think it was Gandhi that was said of him, like, you know, I like, I like Christianity as Jesus, but I don't like his followers. Otherwise, I'd become a Christian. <laughs> well, Gandhi, you're looking at the wrong one. Just like us, we will look at one another. We will look at another Christian and say, look at how they're feeling. See, this exact, those hypocrites, that's exactly why I don't want nothing to do with them. Get your eyes off of another person and look at the only person that's worthy to behold. You look at Jesus. Because now Jesus does something. In this three years of ministry, he reveals the heart of the Father to people who knew not the heart of God. And as we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, we've been seeing that. The Pharisees were keeping people from understanding the heart of God, and they were the religious teachers. But Jesus began overriding all of their traditions and teaching really who the Father is. And now we come to an interesting point this final week of Jesus' life. Jesus comes riding in to the Mount of Olives from the east as it was prophesied in Zechariah. What's interesting of Jesus coming in from the east? That's the same direction that the glory of God originally left. Now Jesus is coming in into the Mount of Olives from the east. The Mount of Olives is on the east of the city and he's looking at a city and what does he think? What does he feel? He wants to wrap them up like what? A mother hen with her chicks. But they refuse. They reject him. Jesus comes in. As he's coming in on his triumphal entry, they hadn't rejected him yet. They began crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And they start throwing down their coats and their palm leaves because what do they think Jesus is there to do? Run those nasty Romans out of here that we can finally have our land and have our, have our kingdom and reestablish everything that needs to be here. But that's not what Jesus came to do the first time. The Bible says Jesus will come twice. The first time he comes as a lamb. The second time he comes as a what? As a lion. He is coming. According to Revelation, he is coming to war. And he is coming to war. And that day is coming. And we will see the lion roar. But he came as a lamb the first time. And he tells his disciples, go. Go and prepare for us the Passover. Because I've earnestly desired to eat this one with you before I suffer. Jesus in multiple places says, I am coming in order that, I'm go that I will die. When, when Peter begins to say, let it not be so, let it not be so, Jesus. No, 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 no. You will not die. You, th th these things won't happen to you. You won't go through these sufferings. You all remember what Jesus says to him? Get behind me. Anything that diminishes Jesus getting to the cross, this idea that sometimes we, we hear Jesus is trying to get out of going to the cross, we have to reject it. When Peter tried saying to him, no, 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 let these things not happen to you, Jesus himself said, get behind me, Satan. Now look what happens here in relation to at Passover. Jesus has Passover with his disciples. Those of us that have been around for a while or that were here on Wednesday, Jesus is instituting communion, the Lord's Supper. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus is betrothing his disciples that night um, while he's doing Passover. He institutes this betrothal during the Passover. This do in remembrance of me, Christianity, we keep it as, oh, we just do the, the, the piece of bread and the cup. We do the Lord's Supper. We do communion. Jesus is actually talking about the whole thing. Do all of Passover in remembrance of me. Because why? As we saw on Wednesday, it all points to Jesus. It all exalts Jesus. It all lifts and raises him up. So Jesus has Passover with his disciples literally on Wednesday night, 1,992 years ago. And then Jesus, the Bible says, then Jesus sings some hymns with his disciples. And he goes out to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And Jesus prays for three hours the same prayer. Father, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. Jesus prays the same prayer for three hours and the disciples keep falling asleep. We often hear it said that Jesus is attempting to get out of the cross at this point, that he's begging the Father, Lord, if there be any other way, Father, if there be anything else, let us do that. Nonetheless, your will be done, not mine. And we often interpret it this way because from when I've seen it written or when I hear that talk about it, it's because it allows us to identify with Jesus going through agony. What's to say that just because Jesus is in 
during agony that he's wanting to get out of that agony. Make sense? What's the implications behind this idea that Jesus is trying to look for another way? If there be any other way, let's do that. There's serious implications with that thought. It means that the incarnation, Jesus coming to, 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 to earth in human form, is of no purpose. He's trying to get out of doing that. If you dig in real deep, you'll start reading things about the counsel of God, that all of this was planned before the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain, Revelation. You start seeing there is, Jesus never attempted to try and get out of going to the cross. No, 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 no. Rather, when he's in the garden, he tells us right there in the words, my spirit is what? Meaning internally, I am resolved to do this. I want to get there. But my flesh is what? I'm going to collapse. The body is literally going to stop under the weight of what I'm beginning to take upon myself and drink. And what is he beginning to drink? It's in the word cup there. He's beginning to drink the cup of redemption, redeeming humanity for God. I don't want to be able to relate to God. You understand that? Because that means I've diminished God down to my level. But it's something else entirely when God can relate to me. Does that make sense? That's exactly what the writer of Hebrews says, that Jesus, our great high priest, in every way and respect, was tempted as we are, and so he is able to relate to us. Jesus is praying this prayer, pleading to the Father, Lord, let me get to what I came to do. In fact, John chapter 12 even says, now that my soul is troubled, Jesus is saying this, like, hey, now that I'm I'm going to experience this great anguish, what then shall I say? Father, remove me from this hour, but for this hour is why I came. Father, glorify your name. And the Bible goes on to say a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Some that heard it thought it was an angel. Others that heard it thought it was simply, they actually did think it was God. But here's what's interesting. Jesus then says, this voice didn't come for my benefit. It came for yours. Because Jesus was already resolved. The scriptures already knew what he was. He, he told his disciples multiple times what he was going to do. Now that it came that moment, he's suddenly trying to get out of it. When Peter tries to say to him, let it not happen to you, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Your mind's not set on the things of God. You need to get set on the things of God, Peter. Jesus rejects this idea multiple times. Again, the writer of Hebrews says it was the joy set before Jesus to endure the cross. So let's talk about the cross here for a minute. How could Jesus get any joy in doing this? Well, Jesus even makes this comparison to childbirth talking about the sweet suffering and agony that he was going to go through. He says, like a mother, when she's in the throes of, of delivery and all the pain and God ah, that's going on during that time, all those childbirthing pains, she goes through that agony, through that, and she quickly forgets that agony because she, once the child is born because she rejoices in a new life brought into the world. So, what's interesting to me is that as mothers often go through that and how horrible that that is, many of y'all just have more babies. Like, you forget the agony that you just went through and all the anguish and like, let's do it again. Because why? Our mind, because of the joy of what's being received through that agony. Just because Jesus is going through agony, the great joy that he's going to have and the opportunity of extending his forgiveness to you that you can spend forever with him, he'll go through that agony every day of his life. Because that's the love of Jesus. He's not trying to get out of that anguish or that agony because there was joy in it and that opportunity that you might receive what he offers you to spend forever with him. Amen. Okay. So Jesus is strengthened by an angel, according to the Gospel of Luke. An angel comes and strengthens him. And he goes and wakes up his disciples. Come on, you knuckleheads, wake up. The the mob's coming now, right? And Peter gets up like, oh, I'm ready now, right? I'm ready, right? The mob comes, and what does he do? 
pulls out a sword, slashes off an ear. Like, let's go, every one of you, come on, let's do it, right? And what does Peter say to, I'm sorry, what does Jesus say to Peter? Put away your sword. Don't you know I can't call legions of angels here? See, Jesus always was capable of getting out of death. But Jesus says, no one, no one takes my life. The Jews didn't take my life. The Romans didn't take my life. Satan didn't take my life. I, I choose to lay my life down because I have the authority to take it back up again. Jesus is in full resolve every step of the way in what he's going through. So the mob takes him. They beat him. They hit him. They put a, they put a, a sack over his head and punch him and say, prophesy, who hit you? Who hit you? They begin mocking him. He's brought before Caiaphas like we talked about. He's brought before the Jews. They find no fault in him, so they have to get worthless men to make false accusations against him in order that they can accuse him of some sort of blasphemy. Then Jesus is taken early in the morning. He's taken them uh, to, uh, to Herod, and he's taken the Pilate. They equally find no fault in him. And the crowds cry out anyways, crucify him. Crucify Jesus. And Jesus is then, before he is crucified, he goes through scourging. Now, Wednesday night we talked about this, but it's important we talk about it again tonight. I'm sorry, to, to this morning. Because Jesus going through scourging, we can just look at that word and just kind of pass over it and miss, miss the, the intensity of what is going on there. When, when somebody is scourged, it's, uh, the Romans perfected torture, by the way. I mean, they, they were exceptionally good at it. They would do things that would keep you alive, just barely, just so they can keep torturing you. So the way the scourging worked is you were typically stripped down naked and you were tied to a post. And then they would take this whip and this whip, at the end of the whip, it would finger out, it would branch out. And then at the, end, at the end, in those additional fringes, those additional fingers, they would embed uh, iron, pieces of stone, pieces of bone. And they would throw that thing into the back of whoever they were scourging, and then they would rip it out. And you can imagine the stone and the bone and the iron going deep into the skin and ripping it off. The whole intention, again, <laughs> was to inflict as much pain in you as possible without you dying. And people often would die just from the shock of scourging. And Jesus' back is completely ripped off. I want to read us something. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance and is formed beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which he has been told, uh, has been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Jesus, as Isaiah is talking about here, is fulfilling this passage that he is going to go through a beating where he won't even look human anymore. Those fingers on that whip would, would, would come around, would catch his face, it would catch his neck, it would catch his arms, it would catch his thighs, it would catch everything. He was beaten so bad, he didn't even look human anymore. People would hide their fades when they saw him because it was just so gory, it was so tough to see. How many have seen the Passion of the Christ? Okay, that's, just, that's a very small glimpse of what Jesus actually went through. They did a great job in showing what that whole process looks like going through that. Jesus would have looked worse, and he would have been naked, totally humiliated going through this. Isaiah goes on to say, but by his stripes we are healed. Jesus, joyfully going through the scourging, as he takes this beating, by his stripes we are healed. In the Hebrew, it's, it's really more in the singular, by his stripe we are healed. Because if there was even a sliver of skin to be able to differentiate between the marks in his back, they could have used the plural word for stripes. But his back was basically one big gaping hole. It was ripped off. This is why in Psalm 22, as we mentioned, as Jesus is affixed to the cross, he's like, I can look down and I can see my bones. How can you see bones unless everything that, protecting the bone is ripped away? 
No wonder Jesus, when he's taking his cross and he's carrying that heavy wooden cross against a bare open back, he's falling and collapsing under it. He has no strength of the shock his body just went through, let alone the pain of something raw like wood rubbing against the raw flesh. And yet it was the joy, the joy set before Jesus to endure this. Before he went through scourging, he was in the garden praying, I know what's about to come, and I want to do it. And the hopes that after I do this for you, that you would receive what I have to give you. The hopes that you might actually receive the forgiveness I offer to you that you would spend forever with me. There is no other way to do this. Why did Jesus have to go through this? Because the blood of bulls and goats do not cleanse away the guilty sin of man. It takes an innocent man to stand in the place of guilty man to forgive them and wash them clean. Something has to happen with God's wrath. God has to do something with it. If God just pretended like, oh, we're just going to pretend like it never happened, la, 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 right? He can't do that because then he's no longer righteous. He's no longer true. He's no longer good. There's a righteous standard that has to be met. And God did not want to put his wrath upon you. So what did God say? God said, I will go and stand in your place, that I will receive all of my own wrath upon me so you never, ever have to experience it. What kind of love is that? You show me another world religion, another faith that even remotely offers something like that, where the God that humanity is trying to please says, you can't do anything to please me. I need, I'm going to come do something for you to make this right. Every other faith is all about you work as hard as you possibly can in order to make this God happy. Christianity is totally inversed. I will do everything on your behalf because there's nothing you can do to satisfy my wrath. I'm going to do something in you for you on your behalf, though you don't deserve it, because I love you. I love you. I love you. And Jesus goes to the cross, and he's affixed to the cross. And the Bible gives us incredible details about the hour that he was placed on the cross and about uh, the time that he died. The Bible says that Jesus was put on the cross at 12 noon, and he died at 3 p.m. That happened a few days ago. We often hear the tradition of Good Friday. Jesus died on a Friday, and then he resurrected on a Sunday. Well, how we started off, Jesus said, the only sign I'm going to give you is as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You don't get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. It doesn't work. You can count it up all you want. You ain't going to get it. It's because tradition cheapens what Christ is actually doing. Jesus does spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth if he dies on a Wednesday. Passover, as the Passover lamb of God. This do in remembrance of me, church, this is why we do it. Because it all points back to what Jesus has done on our behalf. Three days and three nights, Jesus is in the heart of the earth. And he resurrects. The reason why we get this, this tradition, there's a few reasons for it, but predominantly because of our misunderstanding of the way the Jewish culture works, the way the feast days work. It generally is lined up with this. Well, when Jesus was put on the cross, the Bible says that the Sabbath was coming, so they had to hurry up and get Jesus off the cross before the Sabbath starts. Well, that is true. But it's not referring to the Saturday Sabbath. It's referring to a high holy Sabbath called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this is the problem that we have in Christianity is that we're illiterate in Scripture. We have the ability to read, but we don't read it. When we read our Bible, we find out that Passover is on the 14th of Nisan, and immediately following that is the Feast of Unleavened Bread that goes for seven days. And then in the midst of that, the Feast of First Fruits is going to take place. It's the first day of the week after the weekly Sabbath, the first, first Feast of first fruits will arrive on a Sunday. Why is this all significant? Because Jesus is fulfilling it. And let me show you. Jesus fulfills all the requirements as a Passover lamb. And we went through that on Wednesday. We didn't even go through all of it. There's so much depth within there. But then the high holy Sabbath is coming. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is beginning. There is no work to be done on that day. Not on the first day that it starts, nor on the seventh day when it ends. And what's interesting is that 
Israel should go through all of their house and seek and search for leaven and remove the leaven from their house. Leaven is always is, is exemplified of sin. It's always referring to sin. And so what is Jesus doing? Jesus is fulfilling the Passover lamb requirements. He's also fulfilling the Feast of Unleavened Bread because he, his blood is cleansing us of all of our what? Of all of our sin. He's satisfying the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now we come up to the Feast of First Fruits. That was a, that was a great celebration with, uh, for, for, for the Jewish people because they would bring the first of their crops and bring it into the temple and rejoice in the Lord for the goodness of him blessing their crops and giving them abundance. And they often had abundance. You understand that when Jesus resurrected, he was fulfilling the feast of first fruits. And this is why the Bible says that Jesus is the first fruit of all creation, that he is the first fruit of God. Jesus is satisfying all of these requirements all the way through. So, what does that mean? If Jesus didn't actually resurrect, all of this is futile and it means nothing. It means we gather here on Sunday for some of us, just a Christmas and Easter service, right? We gather here with complete, total futility and honestly stupidity unless Jesus actually did resurrect. And if Jesus did resurrect, then we have to pay attention because Jesus is either Lord, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. The amount of evidence that is surrounding the resurrection of Jesus is overwhelming. I don't know if anybody's actually ever studied out or looked out the resurrection. You study and look out the resurrection, the evidence surrounding the resurrection, it's overwhelming. There is so much evidence pointing to the resurrection that it's actually a greater, firmer, established fact than things that happened in Roman history. And we've got good accounts of that. We have things that happened in Egyptian history. We have good accounts of that. And historians will say these are absolutely true events that literally took place. None of us were there to see it. So how do we know if it's true? It's because we use what's called the minimalist facts theory. What's, what's the minimum amount of facts that are required and able to establish and prove that an event actually took place in history that none of us experienced? Historians use it all the time. You use their same reasoning, their same logic, their same methods, and you put it to the resurrection, the resurrection is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. There's nobody who doesn't believe in God because they, because they say, well, I, I just don't believe because I don't see how God could raise somebody from the dead. No, because the evidence actually disproves their thinking. The evidence does show that this man named Jesus not only lived, that he died, and that he rose from the grave. What well, the problem is, it's not head knowledge. It's a heart issue. Because you know what happens if I have to submit to this Jesus? If I have to respond to what this Jesus says, it means I'm no longer the God of my own life. I no longer get to make my own decisions. I no longer get to do whatever I want to do. Well, the reality is, beloved, you're not already. Because the wages of sin is death. There is no getting around it. We've already earned death. But the free gift of salvation is from God, and he gives it through Jesus Christ, his son. We're going to end here. Jesus resurrects from the grave. And then he goes and he gives an account to his disciples. He gives them this great commission. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some still doubted. And Jesus said to them, and, uh, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So beloved, what does the resurrection mean to us? To the Christian, this is what it means. It means that God has put all authority in Jesus and Jesus then comes and empowers us in order to go. Now, we're very good with, well, somewhat. Christianity is somewhat good with this idea of go, going into the world to evangelize. But 
that is, just, that is just a command. The command is to go. So every single one of us have a responsibility to go into our respective workplaces, our schools, or whatever. Any of us that want to claim Jesus as our Savior, our, our get out of hell card, right? If that's just all Jesus is to you, I don't think you're a believer yet. But if Jesus is truly your Lord, he has changed something in your life, and he's, he's working within you, you can tell you're a different man and woman than you were 10 years ago, five years ago, a year ago. If you're not actively improving, you need to ask yourself, what's going on within me? Jesus says, go. It's a command. But then he gives the imperative. Go to do what? To make disciples. Beloved, this is where we're failing, church. This is where we're failing. We've got to make disciples. That means teaching them the things concerning God, the biblical a literate rate and illiterate rate in Christianity is vast. That falls on nobody's shoulders except our own. All of us that claim Jesus to be our Savior and Lord, that's our fault. And we got to take that by the reins and say, what? I'm going to listen to my risen Savior, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to teach. I'm going to make disciples. And baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is something very interesting that Jesus says. Because in the Greek, this word name, it's in the singular but yet there's three people, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because Jesus himself is identifying that it is a triune God. And here it is again, this imperative, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. To the Christian, that's our decree, that's our command, this is what the risen Jesus has told us to go and do. To the unsaved, I don't know if there's anybody in here that's unsaved, but to the unsaved, none of this applies. To the unsaved, it's still only death that is awaiting you. Jesus says, I've come to bring you life and that you might have life abundantly. We have gone through the, the general summary of the Bible, working us through what was severed in the garden, what happened in the garden, this, 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 this great chasm that now separated God and man. Notice Jesus was found in a garden doing what? Not failing. Not saying, try and get me another way, God but pleading to the Father, give me the strength to get to where I need to go in order that I can reconcile and fix what Adam lost, that I can bring all man unto myself, that they can spend with me forever in eternity, if and only if they repent of their sins and receive me as their Savior and Lord. And this is what Jesus came to offer, life, and that you might have life more abundantly. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for the depth of your word. We thank you for the expression of your heart. We thank you that you don't leave anything unreasonable. Everything you do is rational. There's explanation. There's purpose. There's understanding behind it. Father, I pray if there's anybody in here that has not given their heart to you, that has not given their life to you, that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would hear you pricking their heart, that you would, they would feel you tugging at their heart saying, respond and give your heart to me. Give your life to me. Let me, let me take the bondage. Let me take the chains. Let me take the burdens. Let me have all of that. And in return, let me give you my life. Let me give you my righteousness. Let me make you a new creature, a new person. If that is you today, pray this with me. And it's not the prayer that saves you. It's your heart. It's, your, it's in responding in your heart to Jesus that saves you. But you can pray something like this. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming and dying in my place. I believe that you were buried after you were crucified. I believe you spent three days in the grave and that you resurrected to new life in order that I can be saved and forgiven all of my sins, all of my junk. Jesus, your word says to give you all of my burdens, all of my cares, all of my anxieties because you care for me and that your burden is light and your yoke is easy. God, I want that exchange with you. I'm tired of doing this on my own. I'm tired of being half in and half out. I'm tired of playing the game. 
I believe that you are who you say that you are, and I ask you to be my Savior. I ask you to be my Lord, and that I will, from, from this day forward, will be a new creation. To every Christian in here, I ask that you also search your heart. What does the resurrection mean? Is this just something we do out of habitual habit? Is this just something of, of habit that we celebrate, or is there something depth, deep within this? What is God saying to your heart today? God, I pray that you work in every single one of our hearts. Let us not be satisfied with casual, complacent, cultural Christianity, but give us a, a fire and a passion for the purity of your kingdom. Let us be satisfied with nothing less. God, I pray that you would fill us with a, a great love for this covenantal relationship that Jesus has reconciled and made right, has restored us to you, that we would actually operate, experience you, hear you through this new relationship. I pray, God, that you would be pleased in us, that you would be pleased in me. Thank you that there is no condemnation found in those that are found in Christ Jesus. You encourage us to more and more of you continue wooing us after your heart, Father. Teach us what it means to be truly abandoned unto the leading of the Holy Spirit. 